In his 1881 and 1887 experiments, Albert Michelson discovered the Earth was not moving around the Sun. As Michelson himself described the results of his experiment, this conclusion directly contradicts the explanation which presupposes that the Earth moves. But since his colleagues, including Albert Einstein, were diehard Copernicans who didn't want to believe that Michelson had discovered a motionless Earth, they proposed his experimental apparatus was distorted by Earth's motion through space and thus Michelson's apparatus only made it appear as if the Earth wasn't moving. In scientific parlance, we call this the fallacy of petitio principii, that is, using as proof a moving Earth, the very thing one is trying to prove, a moving Earth. Let me explain. The first light beam was pointed westward because it was the presumed direction of the Earth's movement around the Sun. The second light beam was pointed northward, and thus away from the direction of the presumed moving Earth. The first light beam should have been affected by Earth's movement through space if the Earth is moving around the Sun at an accepted speed of 66,000 miles per hour. If so, the first beam would have traveled slower than the second beam of light. But that didn't happen. Both light beams traveled at nearly the same speed. According to Michelson, the first beam traveled only about one-sixth of the speed it needed if the Earth was moving around the Sun. The conclusion, as Michelson notes above, should have been that the Earth isn't moving around the Sun. Other prominent physicists have noted the same truth. There was just one alternative. The Earth's true velocity through space might happen to have been nil. Physicist Arthur Eddington The data of the Michelson-Morley tests were almost unbelievable. There was only one other possible conclusion to draw, that the Earth was at rest. Bernard Jaffe Thus, failure of the Michelson-Morley experiment to observe different speeds of light at different times of the year suggested that the Earth must be at rest, and it was therefore the preferred frame for measuring absolute motion in space. Yet we have known since Galileo that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Why should it be at rest in space? Adolf Baker The easiest explanation was that the Earth was fixed in the ether and that everything else in the universe moved with respect to the Earth and the ether, such an idea was not considered seriously, since it would mean, in effect, that our Earth occupied the omnipotent position in the universe, with all the other heavenly bodies paying homage by moving around it. James Coleman The Michelson-Morley experiment confronted scientists with an embarrassing alternative. On one hand, they could scrap the ether theory which had explained so many things about electricity, magnetism, and light, or if they insisted on retaining the ether, they had to abandon the still more venerable Copernican theory that the Earth is in motion. To many physicists, it seemed almost easier to believe that the Earth stood still than that waves, light waves, electromagnetic waves, could exist without a medium to sustain them. It was a serious dilemma, and one that split scientific thought for a quarter of a century. Many new hypotheses were advanced and rejected. The experiment was tried again by Morley and by others, with the same conclusion, the apparent velocity of the Earth through the ether was zero. Lincoln Barnett, forward by Albert Einstein. What happened when the experiment was done in 1887? There was never, never in any orientation at any time of the year, any shift in the interference pattern. None, no shift, no friend shift, nothing. What's the implication? Here was an experiment that was done to measure the speed of the Earth's motion through the ether. This was an experiment that was ten times more sensitive than it needed to be. It could have detected speeds as low as two miles per second instead of the known twenty miles per second that the Earth moves on its orbital motion around the Sun. It didn't detect it. What's the conclusion from the Michelson-Morley experiment? The implication is that the Earth is not moving. Richard Wolfson Michelson and Morley found shifts in the interference fringes, but they were very much smaller than the size of the effect expected from the known orbital motion of the Earth. John D. Norton This null result was one of the greatest puzzles of physics at the end of the 19th century. One possibility was that velocity would be zero 
and no fringe shift would be expected. But this implies that the Earth is somehow a preferred object. Only with respect to the Earth would the speed of light be c as predicted by Maxwell's equations. This is tantamount to assuming that the Earth is the central body of the universe. Douglas C. Giancoli. But the diehard Copernicans of that day were not about to accept the prima facie results of Michelson's experiment. They knew the catastrophic scientific, cultural, and religious implications if it was experimentally shown that the Earth is fixed in space. In a word, the whole world would have been turned upside down, literally and figuratively. Pressured to provide a scientific answer to the world, they searched for a way to make it appear that the first light beam did indeed provide six-sixth of the speed required for an Earth moving around the Sun. To do so, they thought up an ingenious but devious explanation. As noted above, they claimed the Earth's movement around the Sun contracted the metal enclosure in which the first light beam traveled. If the length of the housing was contracted, then the first light beam does not need to travel as far as when the housing is not contracted. This would account for why the speed of the two light beams did not differ much. With this contrived explanation, they proposed to the world that the contraction of Michelson's apparatus was the reason the Earth appeared to be motionless. In effect, if someone said to them, you claim the Earth is moving, but you admit you cannot detect that movement by any experiment, they would retort, well, we can't detect it because every time we try to do so, the length of the experimental apparatus shrinks just enough to conceal the movement, which makes it impossible to measure the Earth's movement. Again, we see the fallacy of Petitio Principii in play. From start to finish, the whole enterprise was ad hoc. Length contraction wasn't even contemplated previously, much less was it an established fact of science. But in this emergency situation, length contraction was invented on the spot so that the science establishment would have at least some hypothetical answer as to why Michelson's experiment showed the Earth was motionless. Everyone could breathe a sigh of relief. The irony, as of this date, is that no one has ever detected a length contraction in a moving object. In fact, modern physicists can't even agree on what length contraction is or how it would be manifested. Since they insist the Earth is moving around the Sun, yet cannot detect it moving, nevertheless, they needed some physical and mathematical way of accounting for it since there is obviously a difference between motion and non-motion, so length contraction became their convenient scapegoat. This is the essence of the special relativity theory that Einstein invented in 1905. It was invented solely to answer Michelson's experiment, as Einstein himself said. To the question whether or not the motion of the Earth in space can be made perceptible in terrestrial experiments, we have already remarked that all attempts of this nature led to a negative result. Before the theory of relativity was put forward, it was difficult to become reconciled by this negative result. Whereas in 1892, Hendrik Lorenz had hypothesized that the ether of space was what caused the contraction, Einstein decided to dispense with ether and attribute the cause to relative motion. In effect, Lorentz at least proposed a physical cause for his claims of length contraction, but Einstein never explained how relative motion could shrink objects. Hence, during his day, various philosophers accused him of violating the principle of cause and effect. So whatever the cause of the contraction, in order to give the ad hoc theory some semblance of credibility, the required amount for the metal enclosure to contract was put into a mathematical equation called the Lorentz Transform. It has become the most famous and most used equation in modern physics. Essentially, whatever tests disagree with their belief that the Earth was moving around the Sun could now be mathematically transformed into their desired result, as well as give the semblance of being scientific. But the transform of length required another transform. Since they contracted the length, they also had to dilate the time, since if a moving object has its length contracted, 
It is not going to get from point A to point B in the same time as when it is not contracted. To increase the time of travel, they use the same transform equation as above, but since they are increasing instead of decreasing, they turn the multiplier into a divider to get the following equation. Of course, just as there is no proof that length contracts, there is no proof that time dilates. They just need it to make everything appear to balance if they are going to insist that the Earth is moving around the Sun when the empirical evidence says that it's not. It's easy for them. They just put up a theory and represent it by a mathematical equation to erase any discrepancies the experiment shows against their theory. The transforms are not over. They must also add mass increase, since if a moving object has its length contracted, then it will have a larger mass per unit volume when it gets to point B. So to make the mass larger, they use the same exact transform equation as for time dilation. Often in the debate over the relevance of Michelson's experiment, the issue of inertial frames presents itself. An inertial frame is one in which an object is at rest or is moving in uniform motion and not accelerating or decelerating. If the Earth is moving around the Sun, it is a non-inertial frame since it is accelerating. In physics, all objects that move in a circle are considered accelerating even though they go the same speed. As such, one is hampered when doing experiments on Earth due to the effects of acceleration on the apparatus. So, in order to make Michelson's experiment valid, that is, one that takes place in an inertial frame, a relativist will create the inertial frame by the above transform equations. Once again, it is easy to see the fallacy of Petitio Principii at work in their thinking. For those who accept the prima facie results of Michelson's experiment, that the Earth is not moving, the Earth is already shown to be an inertial frame because it is at an absolute rest. Thus, there is no need to create inertial frames for the Earth, and thus no need to use a transform equation. Incidentally, we should note one more important facet of Michelson's experiment before we move on. We saw above that the experiment showed only one-sixth of what was required for an Earth moving around the Sun. This one-sixth is important for another reason. It showed that space was composed of something substantive. The name given to it by Lawrence Maxwell and all other scientists was ether. No one knew precisely what it was composed of, but they correctly deducted that space cannot be nothing, since metaphysically nothing cannot exist. Space must be something composed of something physical, although, like air, we cannot see it because it is invisible. It doesn't matter what you call it, the fact is it must exist. Quantum mechanics has suggested that the ether's basic component is Planck particles, which are 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the electron. Another type of ether may be the electron-positron dipole particle, which was discovered in 1932 by Carl Anderson. In any case, the substance of space, which we call ether, is detected in Michelson's 1881 and 1887 experiments, as well as his 1897 experiment with an above-ground apparatus. Since light moves so fast, it can serve to measure the effect on something as small as ether particles. His interferometer was so accurate it could measure 100 times more than it was required to measure. As such, Michelson's interferometer didn't measure enough ether to match an Earth moving at 66,000 miles per hour around the Sun, but it did measure a little ether, otherwise his results would not have shown one-sixth, but zero-sixth of ether presence. Michelson noted the small presence on his 1887 paper. The actual displacement was certainly less than the 20th part of this, and probably less than the 40th part. But since the displacement is proportional to the square of the velocity, the relative velocity of Earth in the ether is probably less than one-sixth of the Earth's orbital velocity, and certainly less than one-fourth. This was not good for Einstein. He candidly admitted that if any ether was detected, even a little bit, his theory of special relativity would automatically be falsified. This was noted in Einstein's statement to Sir Hubert Samuel in Jerusalem. If Michelson Morley is wrong, then relativity is wrong. In other words, Einstein was forced to assume that because Michelson did not find enough ether for an Earth revolving around the Sun, then Michelson couldn't have found any ether. But if this conclusion of Einstein's was wrong, 
then his whole relativity theory would be falsified automatically, since even a little ether would act as an absolute frame and thus nullify relativity. Noted physicist Charles Lane Poor of Columbia University reiterated the problem. The Michelson-Morley experiment forms the basis of the relativity theory. Einstein calls it decisive. If it should develop that there is a measurable ether drift, then the entire fabric of the relativity theory would collapse like a house of cards. So Einstein was banking on the hope that since Michelson did not detect the required amount of ether for the Earth moving around the Sun, he could conclude that the ether simply didn't exist. Hence, the detection of one-sixth of the required ether was thus conveniently chalked up to experimental error. The facts show otherwise, however. Every interferometer experiment performed from Michelson in 1881 to Juice in 1930, which is 50 years of the same results from a dozen different experimenters, detected one-sixth to one-tenth. Einstein was so bothered by this fact that he hired what can be called a scientific hitman, Robert Shankland, to seek to discredit the experiments, especially the most comprehensive interferometer experiments performed by Dayton Miller between 1908 and 1921. But at this point in time, the 1910s and 1920s, the world was only too happy to accept Einstein's series and reject anyone who challenged him. After all, Einstein was the Earth mover. He made the Earth move around the sun and thus saved mankind from having to admit that popular science had misled the world for over 500 years. For the geocentrist, the only thing left to answer is, from where did one-sixth of ether originate? The simple answer is, since the universe with its ether is rotating around a fixed Earth, some of that ether spilled into Michelson's 1887 interferometer when he was trying to detect if the Earth was moving around the Sun. This is confirmed by the fact that Michelson did another experiment in 1925 in order to measure the ether movement for the daily rotation between space and Earth. In that experiment, he found six-sixths of the required ether for a daily rotation. Hence, it is logical to assume that the one he found in 1887 came from the same ether he later detected in his 1925 experiment. Since the ether in his 1887 experiment hit the interferometer orthogonally instead of linearly, it would only pick up one-sixth of the total ether in space. You will often hear modern devotees of Einstein claim that he invented special relativity as an answer to Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics. They do this because they don't want to admit that Einstein invented special relativity for the express purpose of making it appear the Earth was moving around the Sun. They want to make it appear that Einstein invented special relativity out of the pure motives and an independent thought process. The truth is far different. Einstein himself admits the only reason he invented special relativity was due to Michelson's discovery. He writes in 1922, Soon I came to the conclusion that our idea about the motion of the Earth with respect to the ether is incorrect if we admit Michelson's null result as a fact. This was the first path which led me to the theory of special relativity. Be that as it may, the reason the relativist wants to intrude on Maxwell's electrodynamic theory is because, as it stands, electromagnetism doesn't show any characteristics of being relative. Maxwell's experiments from 1865 show us that the effect of an electric coil moving over a stationary magnet is different than a magnet moving over a stationary electric coil, and Maxwell appropriately represented these different reactions by two different equations. Maxwell's experiment and his two equations, actually four equations altogether, but with two main equations, thus show that space and the reactions that occur in it are absolute, not relative since it distinguishes between the two different effects of the electric coil and the magnet, respectively. Since a relativist does not like anything absolute, Einstein sought to make Maxwell's experiment relative, just as he tried to make Michelson's experiment relative. To do so, he used the same transform equations that he had used to make it appear the Earth was moving. As such, the relativist can make it appear that any effect of electricity on magnetism is the same as magnetism on electricity, but in reality, they are not the same. We still use Maxwell's equations today because they are correct, but when the relativist uses them, he must invariably inject the transform equations in order to make Maxwell's two absolute reactions into Einstein's one relative reaction. Without the transform equation, 
Maxwell's findings are diametrically opposed to Einstein's relativity theory. Not surprisingly, Einstein was well aware that Maxwell's findings of the different reactions between an electric coil and a magnet are related to Michelson's unsuccessful attempt to discover any motion of the Earth. In his famous 1905 paper, he seeks to make their respective absolute effects into relative effects. He writes, It is known that Maxwell's electrodynamics, as usually understood at the present time, when applied to moving bodies, leads to asymmetries which do not appear to be inherent in the phenomena. Take, for example, the reciprocal electrodynamic action of a magnet and a conductor. The observable phenomena here depends only on the relative motion of the conductor and the magnet, whereas the customary view draws a sharp distinction between the two cases in which either one of the bodies are in motion. For if the magnet is in motion and the conductor is at rest, then arises in the neighborhood of the magnet an electric field with a certain definite energy producing a current at the place where parts of the conductor are situated. But if the magnet is stationary and the conductor is in motion, no electric field arises in the neighborhood of the magnet. In the conductor, however, we find an electromotive force to which in itself there is no corresponding energy, but which gives rise, assuming equality of relative motion in the two cases discussed, to electric currents of the same path and intensity as those produced by the electric forces in the former case. Examples of this sort, together with the unsuccessful attempts to discover any motion of the Earth relatively to the light medium, suggest that the phenomena of electrodynamics, as well as of mechanics, possess no properties corresponding to the idea of absolute rest. They suggest rather that as has already been shown to the first order of small quantities, the same laws of electrodynamics and optics will be valid for all frames of reference for which the equations of mechanics hold good. In other words, since Einstein firmly believes that the Earth is moving around the Sun, and yet he realizes that he must have an answer for all of the unsuccessful attempts to discover any motion of the Earth, he proposes that the discrepancy can be dealt with by 1. Assuming as a fact that electrodynamics and mechanics did not show states of absolute rest, Michelson did not show us a motionless Earth, and Maxwell did not show us the absolute state of electricity and magnetism, and 2. We are thus obligated to change what appeared to be absolute frames in Michelson's and Maxwell's experiments into relative frames which is noted in his phrase, all frames of reference. In order to do so, that is, in order to make all frames of reference to be valid, Einstein will use the transform equation, which appears on page 7 of his 1905 paper as follows. This is the precise equation used by Lorenz to claim that the arm of Michelson's apparatus had shrunk, with Einstein also adding time dilation. The section of the paper where this transform equation appears begins on page 5 with the title Theory of the Transformation of Coordinates and Times from a Stationary System to Another System in Uniform Motion of Translation Relativity to the Former. Alas, we don't need to go searching for it. Einstein tells us quite candidly what he is doing. He is transforming space and time from a stationary system, a fixed earth, to another system, one of relativity. In fact, the word transformation appears 24 times in his paper as he applies it to every phenomena from time, space, motion, electricity, magnetism, the Doppler effect, stellar aberration, energy of light waves, electron acceleration, to mass increase. It becomes quintessential means to relativize the whole universe and forever the banish the thought of a motionless earth. As we can see, it is all done by mathematics. There is not one iota of physical, empirical evidence to prove the theory. In the relativist mind, of course, there is no need to prove their findings or to justify their transform, since everyone knows the earth is moving around the sun, and everything is moving, and there is no object at rest, and thus the whole universe is relative. In effect, whenever the experiments show an absolute result, the relatives can wave his magic wand and change it into a relative result. This is the essence of special relativity theory that Einstein invented in 1905.
that Einstein believes the Earth is moving, but has no proof for it, as noted in his statement, I have come to believe that the motion of the Earth cannot be detected by any optical experiment, though the Earth is revolving around the Sun. Einstein's admission merely begs the question, if one scientific basis, he can't detect the Earth moving, how does he know the Earth is moving? The truth is, he doesn't know. He just assumes it to be so, since that is what he has been taught since childhood. In fact, the transform equation is then invoked to make it appear as if the Earth is moving around the Sun, but in reality, the transform equation is just an equation that has no ability or authority to determine the issue. Hence, Einstein would admit in 1938. The possibility of solving these difficulties depends on the answer to the following question. Can we formulate physical laws so that they are valid for all coordinate systems, not only those moving uniformly, but also those moving quite arbitrarily relative to each other? If this can be done, our difficulties will be over. We shall then be able to apply the laws of nature to any coordinate system. The struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus would then be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would quite simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. That is, he will employ arbitrary coordinate systems to make the absolute state, a fixed earth, into where either coordinate system can be used, a fixed earth or a moving earth. All the coordinate systems are created mathematically out of thin air by using the transform equation. If they didn't use the transform equation, then they would be stuck with only one coordinate system, the one Michelson found in 1887 when the experimental evidence showed the Earth wasn't moving around the Sun. If you ask a relativist for the scientific validity of using the transform equation, he will simply retort, well, the transform equation was proven to be valid when Michelson did his experiment in 1887. Again, the fallacy of Petitio Principii is readily apparent, since he is using an unproven fact, an Earth is moving around the Sun, as the basis for making the conclusion that the Earth is moving around the Sun. The cause of the fallacy, as Einstein admitted above when he said, though the Earth is revolving around the Sun, is that they insist on using a moving Earth which they claim to know intuitively as the indisputable authority to interpret Michelson's experiment. Consequently, if one firmly believes the Earth is moving, but the experiments show it is not moving, then one's interpretation of the experiment will force one to sh find some way to make it appear that the Earth is moving. In effect, any experiment that shows the Earth is not moving will be math magically transformed into a moving Earth by the transform equation. The transform equation is like a magician waving his wand over the experiments so that the system one does not prefer is transformed into a system one does prefer. Many modern men certainly do not prefer a fixed Earth since a fixed earth would validate much of the history and science prior to our modern age and would show modern man that he is not the objective and non-prejudiced icon of society that he has enjoyed for the last few hundred years. He is little more than a magician who has been feeding the world a steady diet of illusions. All in all, the history of the Michelson experiment show how a preconceived idea, the earth moves around the sun, is made the sole determining factor of how modern scientist is going to interpret the results of any experiment. In order to hold on to his preconceived idea, he will introduce mitigating factors onto the experimental results, and usually this is done by hypothetical concepts and fudged mathematics. The scientist thus convinces himself that because he can invent a mathematical equation that can transform the empirical results, he can keep his preconceived idea of how he thinks the universe must operate. In his mind, the ends justify the means, because he knows the earth revolves around the sun. There is nothing that would make mankind happier than to keep believing that the earth moves around the sun, regardless of what the experiments show. Their god from on high, Albert Einstein, showed them a magical way to avoid such a predicament,
and the world has accepted Einstein as a god ever since. His transform equation has become the magic wand to turn a fixed earth absolute universe into an earth wandering relative universe, as noted by Einstein biographer Abraham Pais put it. A new man appears abruptly, the suddenly famous Dr. Einstein. He carries the message of a new order of the universe. He is a new Moses come down from the mountain to bring a new law and a new Joshua controlling the motion of the heavenly bodies. The new man who appears at the time represents order and power. He becomes the Theos Aner, the divine man of the 20th century. So much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video presentation if you did please subscribe to my youtube channel like the video and share it on your favorite social media sites there's a lot more to come so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time